Uh, it's one of the last books written. Uh, in fact, First and Second John and Revelation, also written by John, are the only books that can be said with confidence to be written at a later date. Before we get started, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just come before you this morning. Lord, uh, you know, Lord, I have nothing without the help of your Holy Spirit, Father. And I just pray this morning that your word would touch hearts, Lord, that you would speak to everyone here somehow, some way, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray we'd grow in our knowledge and our understanding of you, Father, and you would just encourage us, Lord, to walk closer with you. And I ask it through your Son, Jesus. Amen. Apparently, is, this is not working. Is that right? So we won't have verses up here, so you actually have to read your Bible this morning. <clears throat> I'm going to be going from the New King James Version. Uh, but at the time that Jude was written, it was toward the end of the first century. It had been between 30 and 40 years since Jesus had ascended into heaven. Since the Holy Spirit came down and, and, and the apostles had spread the gospel. In fact, during between that 30 and 40 years, the gospel had spread all throughout uh, Asia and, and Europe and the Middle East. Um, at the time, the enemy first came against him through persecution. And he found out that persecution, that fear doesn't work against someone who has the Holy Spirit in their heart. So he figured if he can't get the body from outside, then he'd have to try to attack from the inside. So that's where these false teachers come in. See, Satan realized, he knew that if he could get God's people to take their eyes off of God, if he could get them to question the truth, to question who Jesus was, or to question the validity of the apostles whom God used to build the church, he knew he could get it all to come tumbling down. And the apostles, with the exception of John, they're basically they're out of the picture. They're no longer there to defend the gospel, and the church is in a vulnerable state. So the enemy attacks. The father of lies, he sends in the false prophets. So in order to encourage the body, the followers of Christ, to continue in the faith, God uses, uh, and to keep them from stumbling, God uses Jude through the direction of the Holy Spirit to write a letter to the body to not only encourage them to keep their eyes upon Christ, but to warn them of the false prophets that were in their midst. So we start in Jude, verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother to James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Christ Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. See, James identifies himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother to James, and that's it. Apparently, that was all the introduction he needed to write in order for the body to realize who it was from. But in order for us to find out who Jude actually was, you actually have to do a little digging. And if you do some research, and if you look up the name Jude in the Bible, this is the only place you will find it, right here in, in this letter. But if you dig a little deeper, you'll find that his name was actually Judas. See, in all the Greek manuscripts... His name is Judas. When the English translators translated into English, they changed it to Jude so, so we wouldn't be confused and think it might be Judas Iscariot. Okay? Judas, it's a form of the name, Hebrew name of Judah. Judah was one of the sons of, of Jacob, one of the tribes. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. It was a, a form of that. It was a very popular name at this time in Israel. There are at least six different Judases in the New Testament. So which one was it that wrote Judah? Or there's only two that it could be referring to. And there are a few expositors who think that Thaddeus, one of the twelve apostles, he was called Judas, son of James by Luke in Luke 16.16. 16. But even though he was a son of someone named James, he was not known to have a brother named James. The Jude that wrote this letter calls himself the brother of James and does not identify himself as an apostle. And the one that has been generally accepted as being the author of Jude was Judas, the half-brother of Jesus. See, he had a brother named James, also the half-brother of Jesus. James was an important leader in the church at Jerusalem. And James had also written a letter to the church, the book of James in the Bible. The readers of this letter at, at this time would have no problem understanding who the letter was written by. And Judas starts out by pointing out a very important principle in the body of Christ in his opening line in his letter. He doesn't say, notice he doesn't say, Jude, the half-brother of God. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Instead, he humbly identifies himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. See, Jude knows that God is not a respecter of persons. He knows that your position in society, the amount of dollars in your bank account, your family ties, where you're from, who you are, has no bearing on your relationship to God, with God. In fact, when Jude was a young man, back when Jesus was alive on the earth, he didn't even believe Jesus was a Messiah. He and his brothers, they ridiculed Jesus. 
John 7, 5 says, for even his brothers did not believe him. And I'm sure Jude remembered the time when he, along with his mother Mary and his other brothers, came to speak with Jesus. And they found Jesus encircled by the multitudes. He was teaching them. And we find the story in Mark 3, 31. It says, then his brothers and his mother came. Standing outside, they sent to him, to Jesus, calling him. And the multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. See, Judas realized, Jude realized that it wasn't his position as Jesus' half-brother that gave him any authority whatsoever. But an amazing change has come over Jude. How the Holy Spirit opened his eyes, we don't really know. The Bible doesn't say, but we now see Jude totally sold out to Christ. We see a man that now knows that the only thing that has any bearing on your eternal destiny is that you are a bondservant of Jesus Christ. It's the same with us. I don't know about you. I'm sure many of you are like, like I was before I came to know Christ. I didn't want anything to do with Christ. I ridiculed Christians. But like him... I've come to realize that the only real title of importance that I could have is that I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters. And Jude writes this letter, not to a lost world, but he writes it to the body of Christ. He said, to those who are called, who are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Jude uses three terms to define those who are the body of Christ. And you'll find out through this, this book, Jude seems to use groups of three to describe things. But to the followers of Christ, he says, first, we are called. See, none of us here came to have a relationship with Jesus Christ on our own volition. We don't have the power within us to decide to become one with God. John 6, says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. See, we were all called. We were all invited by the Holy Spirit. And we accepted the invitation. Praise God. If you're here this morning and you don't know, know, know God, there's nothing that I can say. There's nothing that I can say that's going to incur, that will cause you to accept Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit doesn't touch your heart, you won't feel the need to accept Jesus Christ. You have to be called. But Jesus gives that calling to everyone. God says it's his will that none should perish, right? That all should come to repentance. It's like getting a telephone call. If you get a telephone call, you can either answer it or not. And you say, well, how will I know if I'm called? If you, feel, if you feel the tug on your heart, if you hear the word of God being spoken, you hear an invitation to accept Jesus Christ, or you just hear the word of God being spoken, and you feel a tug in your heart saying, you know what, that's for me. I need to become a Christian. Then pick up the phone and answer it. Just say, Jesus, here I am. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. It's that simple. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, I'll give you an opportunity toward the end to accept Jesus Christ. But if, you, if the phone's ringing right now, answer it. Don't wait for me to shut up. Just answer the phone. Say, Jesus, I accept as my Lord and Savior. It is that simple. Second, we're sanctified by God the Father. Sanctified. Sanctification. That's church language. That's called churchies. You don't hear that much outside of a pulpit. And you hear of someone being sanctified, you think of someone that's so holy or, or that you have to wash their hands or something just to talk to them, you know. But it really just means simply set apart. We're all that know Jesus Christ, all of us that have been called, we're sanctified. We're set apart from the rest of the world to do the will of the Father, to reflect Jesus Christ to the world. Sanctification is just the act of becoming more and more like Christ. We're all going through that act of sanctification from the time we accept Jesus Christ to the time we die. It's not a level you can reach. There are churches that do say that. I am now sanctified. I've reached that level. You're being sanctified from the time you accept Jesus Christ from the time that you die. Third, he says, we are preserved in Jesus Christ. And the word preserved means to reo. It means to hold fast, to preserve, to protect, to keep. See, it means you're a child of God, and he, and he has a hold of you. Like his song says, he never lets go. He promises to watch over you, to keep you, to preserve you. And we find that promise in the beginning of the Bible. In Genesis 28, 15, it says, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. And we find it all the way at the end of the Bible and at the end of times in Revelation 3.10. He says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. We find this promise all throughout the Bible. Psalms 121.7 says, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. 
Psalms 145.20 says, The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Matthew 28.10 says, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. And one more thing about this line from Jude, when he says to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, you see the Trinity of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is revealed. The Holy Spirit calls us. We're sanctified by God the Father. We're preserved in Jesus Christ. I thought that was pretty cool. And then Jude greets the body with three words of blessing. He says, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Most of the letters in the New Testament begin with a salutation that includes a blessing. Usually it's grace and peace. Paul really liked to use grace and peace. But Judas uses mercy, peace, and love. But he just doesn't want the blessing to be added to their lives. He wants it to be multiplied to their lives. In verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in, unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it had been on Judas's heart to write a letter to the church. He, he wanted to write them a letter expounding upon their daily walk to walk, walk with Christ, right? He said, for their common salvation. In fact, he was most likely in the process of doing just that. He said, well, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. But then something else was taking place in the body that changed the context of what he wrote to the body. Instead of writing a letter concerning their salvation, he said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was for all, once for all, delivered to the saints. See, Jude now finds it necessary to exhort, to encourage them to contend earnestly for the faith. Contend earnestly is one word in the Greek. It's ep agonizomai. It's a wrestling term. It's the root of our word agonize. And it's, it's in the present infinitive. It, it means to contend, to struggle wholeheartedly to the point of agony, infinitely. See, the struggle for the faith is something that we should never stop doing with all of our might. This faith that Jude is describing, it isn't our own faith or belief in the sense of our trust in God. He's referring to the essential truth of the gospel, the word of God given to us by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And note that this faith that Judas describes, he says, was once for all delivered to the saints. Once and for all is translated of, uh, a translation of the Greek word hapix. It means literally once, only, and forever. You find this word in Hebrews 9, 27, 28. It says, as it appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. And 28 says, so Christ was offered once, only once to bear the sins of many. See, he's saying this faith was for all, for everyone, and it was given to all through the word of God, first by Jesus Christ, and then by his disciples who completed the Bible once for all. It's complete by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 2, 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord it was confirmed to us by those who heard him? See, the revelation of Christ through the Gospels, through the Word of God, is complete, it's inviolate, it's sufficient, it's eternal, it's immutable, and it's not subject to any change. When a religion says, Hey, well, this was actually wrong, we have a new word, don't believe it. Once and for all, it was completed. When false teachers begin to corrupt the word of God, it needs to be brought to light. And that's what Jude is doing. He says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jude's not talking about those who teach other religions outside of the church. He's talking about men who have crept in unnoticed who have crept into the body of believers. And these men are the reason Jude's writing this letter. They were a serious threat to the church. Spurgeon says, Satan knows right well that one devil in the church can do far more damage than a thousand devils outside of her bounds. See, these false teachers, they didn't come in loud and boisterous. Hey, I have a new gospel. You guys are all wrong and you need to listen to me. They were sly. They crept into the body. And on the outside, they appeared to be knowledgeable, godly men. But Jude says they are ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny our only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. These false teachers were turning the grace of God into lewdness. In the King James Version, it says translated, uh, lewdness is translated as lasciviousness. 
It denotes blatant sin, including sexual immorality that's practiced openly, without shame, without any sense of consciousness or decency. Sounds a lot like our world today. And these false teachers were denying both the Father and Jesus Christ. Jude doesn't say how they were denying him. He doesn't say if they were denying Jesus by what they were saying. I mean, they could be teaching another Christ, or they could be saying Christ wasn't really God, or that he was only a spirit being. Those things were taking place at that time. Or they could be just denying him by their ungodly actions, or, or both. But what we do know is that these false teachers were using God's grace as a license to sin. See, they were saying, it's okay if you sin because God's grace is amazing. It will cover everything you do. Sin however you want. The more you sin, the more that God's grace is revealed. In fact, if the more you sin, the more you glorify God. That was their mindset. You know, God, God's grace is amazing, guys. It is amazing. And there's no sin that God will not forgive you of. If you humble yourself before him and ask, he will forgive you of anything. But as a body, as those who follow Christ, we are not to presume upon the grace of God. We are to try and obey his word. Jesus says if we love him, we will obey him. And when we do stumble, and we will stumble, his grace is always there for us. But we are not to blatantly sin and think that God's grace will always be there for us. Hebrews 10.29 says, Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? See, God takes it serious when you blatantly sin against him. And the false teachers that deny Christ, that teach these things, they're still alive in the world today. We still have to deal with them. And there are those that teach today that Christ is not truly God, that he's not eternal, that he was once a man like you, like me, that he was just an angel or that he's Michael the archangel. They don't discourage sin. If it feels good to do it, you have a license to sin. You have a license to trample on the grace. If your heart, you feel in your heart it's okay, then it's okay. And they change the word of God to deceive the believers. Beware. That's what they were doing to Jude. That's what people are doing today here. There have been people who have attended this church, and you have to beware because you can be deceived. There have been people who have attended this church who have been led astray by these false teachers. But even though it seems like these false teachers are getting away with their apostasy, Jude says that these teachers are marked out for condemnation. In the next three verses, he gives us three examples to show the certainty of God's judgment upon those who contend with God. Verse 5, he says, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting change in their darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, that's a lot to say there. Jude gives these three examples from the Old Testament to the body, and he tells the body, hey, you guys knew this, but you needed to hear it again to remind them that those who denied the word and those who deny God will be judged. And first he reminds them of what happened to those that God delivered from bondage in Egypt, who rejected the word of God from Moses. He said, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. You guys know the story. The people chose after God had delivered them from Egypt, after he had delivered them from bondage. The people chose to turn against them, to rebel against them, to rebel against Moses to turn to their own lust and their desires. And because of that, they were not allowed to enter the promised land. And they died in the wilderness. See, there's a price to pay for rejecting God in his word. And second, he gives an example of what happens when not only men, but when angels reject God. And he goes back to a time just before the flood. He said, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting, everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And you think, well, what is Jude talking about? Well, just before the flood, we see in Genesis 6, 1 to 2, it says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Verse 4 says, And the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those who were mighty men, 
who were of old men of renown. Chapter 6 in Genesis in this verse in Jude has caused much confusion, dissension, and debate among biblical scholars and expositors. And even though I've opened up the can of worms, I don't want to dump it all out. So I'm just going to say without going into detail, apparently, just before the flood of Noah's time, when the people of the earth had turned completely away from God, and this is a major theory, that some of the angels who rebelled against God, they left their own abode. They came down to earth either in the form of man or possessed the bodies of man. They had sexual relations with women on the earth and did not keep their proper domain. Not only did God cause a worldwide flood as judgment upon a completely evil world, these angels who were involved, those who left their own abode and didn't keep their proper domain, were bound in chains and are imprisoned still today in darkness, awaiting the day of judgment. If you are an angelic being, there's a price to pay for rebelling against God. And the third example that Jude gives to show the judgment of God is Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. And you all know the story of what took place there. You know the story of Lot, Abraham's nephew. He was the only godly man, him and his family, living in these cities that openly practiced every form of debauchery, sexual immorality, and they considered it normal. Again, much like today. As Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And you all know what happened when God pronounced judgment on these cities, the complete destruction, not only of the cities, but of the people living in them, with only Lot being saved. See, God takes sin seriously. And through Jude, God's giving a serious warning to these false teachers who deny Jesus Christ and lead people astray. But the fact that these examples of judgment end in death for all those who deny God, the real tragedy is that the judgment is just beginning. It's eternal. Jude says that these, through these illustrations, he says they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And it's interesting, Peter describes almost this exact same scenario, almost to a T, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. He said, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of the truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world on the ungodly, and turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. And he delivered the righteous Lot, who was oppressed by filthy conduct of the wicked, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. There will be a day of judgment. You don't get away with contending against the Lord. And there's the similarity between these verses has caused many expositors to believe that Jude borrowed from Second Peter. He undoubtedly knew Peter, and he had probably read Peter's letter. But even if he did borrow, Jude's letter was still inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the interesting thing is this. Peter stated that the false teachers would be coming. He said they will be false teachers among you. While Jews said that they had arrived. He said certain men have crept in. For us today, these false teachers have not only arrived, but they've been here for quite a while. The gospel has been so polluted by them today that most churchgoers have no idea what the word of God really says. And they have no idea who Jesus Christ really is. Of what is required for them to have a relationship with him. That's a sad Sad look on our churches today. And in verses 8 through 11, Jude gives us a look into the character of these false men, of the uh, false teachers, these certain men. He says in verse 8, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, they reject authority, they speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these... Speaking of these false prophets, they speak evil of whatever they do not know, whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, and these they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, they have run greedily in the air of Balaam, for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Again, Jude uses some analogies that 
Those of us time could relate to, they most likely understood what he's referring to, but to us it seems confusing. First, he calls these false teachers, these certain men, dreamers. We're not sure if he's saying that they are out of touch with reality or if they're trying to establish their position by claiming to have prophetic dreams or both. But he reveals the three ungodly characteristics of these false teachers, of these dreamers. He says they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they speak evil of dignitaries. When a false teacher creeps into the body, you can expect one or more of these actions from him or her. They will defile the flesh. They will advocate things that appeal to the flesh as being holy. They will reject authority, both the word of God and of those who, whom God has set in a position of authority. And they will speak evil of dignitaries. That means the leaders of the church. If you have an issue with someone in the church, if you think Brad is a false teacher, you need to go speak to Brad. If you think someone has offended you or something is not being right, you need to go speak to Brad or that person. You don't go speaking to other people. Trying, that causes division. Again, he says, in verse 9, he says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed with the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, in these things they corrupt themselves. And again, here Jude stirs up controversy when he talks about Michael the archangel contending with the devil disputing over the body of Moses. It's not a story that we're all familiar with. In fact, this is the only place in the Bible you're going to find this story. We're not even sure where Jude got it from. But since the letter was inspired by the Holy Spirit, we know that it's true. Whether the Holy Spirit revealed it to him or it was, came from ancient writings, we don't know. All we know is that Michael, the archangel, contended with the, the devil over the body of Moses. We have no idea what the contention is about or why they were contending over his body. In fact, Moses' entire death was a bit of a mystery. Even though he died at the age of 120 years old, he was still, he was still a stud. He was in his prime. Deuteronomy 34 says his vigor and his eyesight hadn't diminished. Physically, there was nothing wrong with him. But we know that he was prohibited by God to enter the promised land because of his disobedience. We know that God told him to go alone to Mount Nebo. And we know that God showed him the promised land from a distance. And we know that he died, that God buried him. And there's no earthly witness to that. In fact, there are those who say he didn't really die, that he was taken to heaven like Elijah and Enoch. They use that story in the New Testament when Jesus being with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration as evidence. Well, since Elijah didn't die and he's on the mountain, Moses must have not died either. But they're not right. I, I really hope that he did die. In fact, I'm sure he did. Because in Deuteronomy 34, 6, it says, And he, speaking of God and Moses, he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite of Beth Peor, and no one knows where his grave is to this day. I'm sure God didn't bury him alive. He died. And this verse in, here in Jude is more proof of it. So why were Satan and Michael contending over his body? Who knows? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say but the point that Jude is trying to make is that if Michael the archangel, an archangel means the head angel, the chief angel, and I want you to realize Satan is not the opposite of God. God has no opposite. God is the creator of all things. God created Satan. Satan, an evil demonic being, a powerful evil demonic being, is the opposite of Michael the archangel, a godly, powerful angelic being. That's who he's opposite of. And if Michael, the archangel, who's as powerful as, or maybe even more powerful than Satan, refuses to accuse Satan, and Satan spent thousands of years contending with God, encouraging people to sin, going around like a roaring lion, seeking who he could destroy, causing people to go to hell. And if Michael, the most godly angel there was, probably dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, then what right does someone have to come into a body and accuse God's appointed leader? They have none. What right does someone have come into this church and make accusations against Brad or against Bill or challenge their word? Like I said before, if they had an issue, they could go talk to them. But to go other people, that's not right. What they're saying is not right. 
what they're teaching is not right. They're not teaching the Bible right. Or they're wrong in that aspect. And they go to other people and try to gain support. It's happened. It's happened to both Brad and Bill in this body. People have come in doing that. They come to people who have itching ears trying to build support. They say things like, whatever, the, the music should be different. We're not praying the right way. The word of God is being taught incorrectly. We should be doing this. We should be doing that. Whatever. What do you say to, what do you say to that when someone comes up to you and tells you that? Take a, take a hint from Michael the archangel. The Lord rebuke you. Stop. Go talk to Brad. You know, if you go to someone and they come up to talk to you and you say, the Lord rebuke you, they might think you're really weird, <laughs> but they'll quit talking to you. <laughs> See, Jude's given us these examples so we will recognize these wolves in sheep's clothing when they come in among the body. Watch out for them. He said, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, and these things they corrupt themselves. These false teachers may speak convincingly, but they only understand things of the flesh, things they know naturally. They don't comprehend the things of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man does not receive things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And then Jude gives three more examples of these false teachers. He said, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So he equates them with Cain, Balaam, and Korah, three men in the Old Testament that faced extreme judgment from God because of their apostasy. And first he gives them a warning from God. Woe to them. He means, look out. Something very bad is about ready to happen to them. And he gives three reasons why. He said, first, they have gone in the way of Cain. Now, what's the way of Cain? Well, Cain and Abel, you're not all aware, were the first sons of Adam and Eve. And they both presented a sacrifice to God. Abel, a sheep herder, presented the firstborn of his flock to the Lord. Cain was a farmer. He offered the fruit of the ground. God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's offering. Why? Maybe God doesn't like farmers, right? See, you guys know that's not the reason God loves everyone. The reason God rejected Cain's offering was because he lacked faith in God. Keep in mind that Jude's main intent of his letter is to encourage the body to keep the faith, to fight for the faith. And that's what Cain lacked, faith. And you might ask, well, how do you know that? Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And we all know what faith is. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, faith is something you believe in, you hope for, but it's not readily evident, something you can't see. But the big question is, is how do you get faith? How does your faith grow? Where does it come from? Guys, this is a very important lesson for those who want to grow in their relationship with God. If there's anything out of this message this morning that you could take home with you, if there was just one thing, this would be the thing I would wish you would take home. Romans 10, 11 is, is how you get faith. Romans 10, 11, 10, 17 says, So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You grow in your faith through reading and obeying the word of God. That's a huge concept. See, Cain didn't have faith because he didn't accept the word of God. And you're going to say, now wait a minute. The word of God hadn't even been written when Cain was alive. So how, do, how could he reject the word of God? You guys are asking some tough questions. But I'm ready for you. <laughs> See, God spoke directly to Cain. God gave Cain every opportunity to repent and have a close walk with him. Right after God rejected Cain's offering, Cain was angry. He was ready to kill. But God spoke to him to encourage him to get back on track. He said in Genesis 4, 6, and 7, he says, The Lord said to Cain, Are you angry? Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, would you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. See, but God rejected, Cain rejected God's words. He didn't want to become righteous, to do what was right. He went with his own pride. That's the way of Cain. Someone who denies the word of God and insists on fulfilling their ungodly desires and pushing their desires on others. That's what these false teachers do. But that's not all. Jews says they have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit. Now, those of you who may not be aware, Balaam was an Old Testament prophet who tried to curse God's people for money. And even when God brought it to his attention, what he was doing... Numbers 22, 12, God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Balaam still tried to curse the people. So God sent an angel to warn him. 
Then Balaam, he realized he, he better knock it off, and he promised to turn back. But still, he still couldn't overcome his greed for money and power, so he rejected God's word to him, and he figured out a way to cause God's people to turn away from God's word and to go back to idolatry. See, there are false teachers today, prosperity doctrine, that still are there out just for your money. The name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it. Those who don't care about the body, where they don't care about the word of God, but they care about fleecing the flock. They're in it for profit. And the third character Jude gives as an example of false teachers is someone who cares about only their own desires. And it's Korah. And that's when the children of Israel were being led by Moses in the wilderness. Korah, who happened to be Moses' first cousin, he was a Levite. He was a man in a position of power. He became jealous. He became envious of Moses and Aaron. He thought he could do a better job leading the people. So he, along with 250 followers that he... he Talked into following him. Hey, Moses isn't doing things right. You need, you need to follow me. They challenged Moses and tried to usurp his position. The end result was the ground opened up and swallowed them. These false teachers like Korah have a lust for power. And when people come into the body and begin rejecting authority and start speaking evil of those that God has anointed, when they start saying, I know more, I'm correct, you should listen to me instead of him, I should be in control. See, that's what they're saying. Avoid them like the plague. The Lord rebuke you. See, verse 12 says, These are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming with their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jews says these false teachers are spots. Uh, the word can also be spots, can be translated hidden rocks. But their spots on their love feasts, their spots, their blemishes. Love feasts were gatherings for the church back then would come together and break bread. It was a potluck style meal, much like our picnics. It was a time for people to fellowship and to minister one to another. And these false teachers would boldly attend and they would literally pig out. They served only themselves. They didn't put the needs of the brethren first. Jude likens them to clouds without water. See, they looked promising. They were a sign of hope, but they had no water. Late autumn, autumn trees, he said they're like late autumn trees without fruit. There was no spiritual nourishment from them. In fact, Jude says they were pulled up by the roots. There isn't even a chance that they could produce fruit. He says they're carried about by wind, raging waves of the sea. They're not grounded. They go from one place to another. They're wandering stars, he said, which, are, by the way, are really neat to look at. But they're impossible to find your way by. Try navigating by a falling star. They may look promising. They may be exciting. They might tickle your ears but they have nothing of value to offer. And as a warning, God says, for them he has reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And then Jude, using a, a quote from the book of Enoch, describes the final judgment of God upon these false prophets. Verse 14, he says, Now Enoch, now Enoch, like Elijah, he was called up to heaven. He never died. He said, The seventh from Adam prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which are ungodly sinners have spoken them against them. There's a lot of ungodly stuff in those, that line there. You don't find this prophecy from Enoch anywhere else in the Bible. Enoch's not a book in the Bible. Jude's quoting from a non-biblical source. The book of Enoch was an ancient book that was highly respected among the Jews and early Christians. They're not even sure who wrote it. Pretty sure that Enoch didn't write it. And just because Jude quotes from it, it doesn't mean that the whole book is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Just the part that Jude quotes from. But what is interesting is that this judgment prophesied by Enoch is not just directed at the false teachers, but at all ungodly people. He said, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed, in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. See, God's going to execute judgment upon them when he returns to rule and reign on the earth. And then Jude gives one last description of these false teachers, these certain men. He says, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Now, in this verse, except for walking according to their own lust, which is a general description that could apply to a lot of different things, each one of the other specific descriptions pertain to the mouth or to the tongue. They're grumblers. They're complainers. They mouth great with swelling words. They flatter people. 
It's not surprising that the last warning that Jude gives us, the body to watch out for, is the tongue. Be careful who you listen to. James 3, 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it's set on fire by hell. James 3, 8 says, No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Be very careful who you choose to listen to. Satan's greatest weapon is deception, lies. He's the father of lies. And finally, Jude gives some practical advice to the body concerning these false teachers. First, he tells us to expect the attack, to expect to have to deal with these false teachers. He says in verse 17, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own and godly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Jude says, be ready. Paul said they're going to come. Remember what the apostles wrote, he said, by direction of the Holy Spirit. And we see Paul warning Timothy to avoid these false teachers. 1 Timothy 6, 3 says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. For suppose that godliness is a means of gain. They're in it for profit. He said, from such, withdraw yourself. I want you to understand one thing this morning too. Neither Paul nor Jude says to confront these false teachers. He doesn't say to get in their face and confront them. He says to avoid them, to rebuke them. And most importantly, Jude gives us instruction on how to contend earnestly for the faith, how to grow in our walk with the Lord, and be prepared for the false teachers when they come, how to make sure we don't stumble. He says in verse 20 to 21, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. First, Jude tells us to build ourselves up in faith. As we've read before, we know we build up your faith by being in the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the Word of God. And second, he tells us to pray in the Holy Spirit. This is not about praying in tongues. It means to allow your prayers to be directed, to be led by the Holy Spirit. In other words, instead of just praying for your personal wants or for all your personal needs, which you can do that, but also pray for those things the Holy Spirit puts upon your heart to pray for. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. See, we are to pray continually those things that the Holy Spirit puts upon our heart to pray for. And third, Jude tells us to keep ourselves in the love of God. Jesus said that if we love Him, we'd obey Him. But it's more than just that. See, God is love. And the way we keep ourselves in God's love is to love one another. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We love one another by being in fellowship and meeting the needs of one another, caring for one another. The way we keep our faith, the way we avoid stumbling in our walk with God, the way we avoid being led astray by false teachers is by the Word, to read the Word, to pray, and to be in fellowship, to love one another. The three-legged stool. Bob always taught the three-legged stool. That's how you achieve the goal of looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ in an eternal life. See, it's all about Jesus Christ, guys. He's the one who preserves us. He's the one who keeps us. Through Him we can do all things. Through Him is fullness of joy. Through Him is peace that surpasses all understanding. Through Him we've been redeemed. Through Him we have eternal life. The last two verses of the chapter say, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a mighty God. Lord, I do pray, Father, you just help us to keep our eyes upon you, Lord. I pray that you help us all, Lord. Just put upon our hearts, Lord, to draw close to you, Lord, to love one another, Lord to stay in your word, Lord, to stay in prayer, to keep that line of communication over, Father. And while every head is bowed, if there is anyone here this morning, and you hear that ring, you hear that call, and you want to look up and accept Jesus Christ, I just encourage you just to look up this morning if there's anyone here. For the rest of us, Lord, I pray, Lord, 
I pray you bless the body, Lord. You know our needs, Lord. You know if we need forgiveness of sin, Father. I pray you'd help us in those areas we struggle with, Lord. You know if we need direction and guidance in our life, Lord. You know if we need encouragement, Father. I pray that, Father. I pray that you know that if we need, Lord, uh, uh, just a, a closer walk with you, Father, I pray that you would encourage us, you'd give us joy, Father. If we need a healing touch, Lord, I pray that you'd give us strength, Lord. Increase our walk with you. Increase our love for you. Bless. I pray a special blessing upon everyone here. And I pray for a blessing on everyone up. A family can't be with them, Father. Touch their hearts, Lord. Keep them safe. Keep everyone going up and back safe, Father. And just bless this body. And I ask these things through your son, Jesus. You all said? Amen. Amen.